All right, good morning, conference. My name is Karen Jeffrey. I'm a PGY1, and I will be discussing cardiac today. Um, first things first, I just want to thank the Clinical Pearls team, some of the ultrasound faculty, and my advisor for helping with my presentation. So this is just an overview of what we'll be discussing. We'll start off with the case. So the chief complaint, I can't breathe. We have a 78-year-old male who's brought in by EMS to CCT. He has a history of diabetes, ESRD, and he's status post a cardiac cath procedure that was done two days ago. And he's coming in with newly onset shortness of breath. These are his vital signs. So he's hypotensive, he's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, and he's standing at about 97 on the mirror. So as the eager intern, I grabbed the ultrasound machine to do a rush exam and put a probe on him, and this is what we see. Does anyone want to describe what's going on here? <laughs> Very good. So, yes, we have an atypical four view. We see a pretty significant uh, circumferential region. We might also see some uh, right ventricular right collapse, which is suggestive of tamponade. So cardiac tamponade. So this is a life-threatening emergency where you have either a slow or rapid accumulation of pericardial pressure that impairs uh, cardiac filling, resulting in some sort of hemodynamic instability. And a little bit of this about the anatomy and physiology briefly. So the pericardium is just the serous sac that surrounds the heart. It normally contains about 25 to 50 mils of serous fluid. And the point at which cardiac tamponade occurs uh, really depends on the compliance. And that varies in an acute versus a subacute state. So in your acute setting, you sort of have this rapid accumulation of fluid that's happening in a very stiff pericardium. So it doesn't really take much, uh, much volume before that critical pressure is met and you have tamponade physiology. Versus in a subacute state, you have this sort of gradual accumulation that's better tolerated because you develop compliance. And so you could have larger volumes before that critical pressure is met and you're in tamponade physiology. So in terms of our clinical, clinical presentation, what is our history really gonna look like? And that also varies in the acute versus the subacute state. Um, the acute, I feel like is a little bit more obvious. It's gonna be more sudden and onset. And this is gonna be, you know, your patients coming in with those penetrating traumas maybe a history of a, some sort of cardiac procedure that was done, as mentioned in our case. Um, these patients are going to typically resemble cardiogenic shock, and obviously urgent intervention is required. Versus in the subacute setting, this can take anywhere from days to weeks to manifest. And patients you want to think about are patients that have a history of maybe some sort of cancer, a history of pericarditis, maybe radiation exposure, um, some sort of like autoimmune diseases that was mentioned in the previous case. And these patients, importantly, can be asymptomatic very early on until um, those critical intrapericardial pressures have been met. So what do our symptoms look like? Um, our symptoms can be very vague, but more often, than not, more often than none, you see chest pain, shortness of breath, patients can demonstrate tachycardia, cardiogenic shock, um, epigastric pain or abdominal pain, even abdominal fullness, and that has something to do with the um, hepatic or visceral congestion that's seen with cardiac tamponade. And then just non-specific symptoms. So these patients can be lethargic, um, they can experience some nausea, vomiting, some weakness. And in terms of our physical exam findings, what are we going to see? So I mentioned next triad just because in learning about cardiac tamponade, I feel like we've all learned about the three Ds the distended neck veins, the distant heart sounds, the depressed, depressed low uh, blood pressure. But more often than none, Bex triad doesn't always exist together. Um, in fact, out of the three components of Bex triad, JDD has the highest sensitivity, and even that's like 76 to 80%. Otherwise, the muffled heart sounds and low blood pressure, the sensitivities for that are actually pretty low. They're 28 to 30%. 
Um, things that physical exam findings that have higher sensitivities, uh, they say is pulses paradoxes, which is that systolic drop in blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, that sensitivity is usually about 82%. Uh, tachycardia is also a common physical exam finding. And then if this is a patient that has a history of pericarditis, you might be able to appreciate a pericardial breath on exam. So what does our workup look like? So um, when you're diagnosing cardiac tamponade, on top of your cl clinical exam findings, imaging is very important. And the gold standard for imaging is our, our ultrasound. And there are classic echo findings that we're going to look at, and I'll go into some detail. Um, additionally, what can be helpful in your diagnosis is EKG as well as a chest x-ray. But again, your echo findings are, are very helpful. As you see in this picture on the right, you see an effusion. You see a little bit of what looks like a right ventricular collapse. And um, a, plural, a pericardial effusion is, is one finding that you would see on ultrasound. So what are the other findings that we're looking at? So on, on top of pericardial effusion that was mentioned, we're looking at systolic collapse of the right atrium. We're looking at diastolic collapse of the right ventricle and an enlarged IVC. Uh, keep in mind, there are other uh, tactics you can use via, via ultrasound to identify cardiac tamponade. Uh, a lot of times those are used by more of the advanced practitioners, but these are um, ones of note to uh, be aware of. So starting with systolic collapse of the right atrium, So as you can see here, it's a very early echo finding, and um, it's really great to see in the parasternal long or apical uh, core view. And why it's an early echo finding is because the uh, pressures in the right atrium are typically lower than that in the right ventricle, so they're more susceptible to collapse. But you see that here, collapse of the atrium. Um, a next important finding is the diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. Uh, this is probably has one of the higher specificities in terms of ultrasound findings. And this is what you're looking at. So um, as you can see in the upper left, the upper left image, you see this uh, significant effusion. You see the scalloping of the right ventricle, or as, um, uh, as was mentioned before, you see this uh, trampoline sign. And when you see this, um, you want to use your M mode setting, which is very helpful. When you use your M mode, you get this picture right here. And you want to line up your marker um, at the level of the mitral valve, and you get this picture. And so what these arrows are indicating is you see the um, pericardial fusion, you see the right ventricular free wall, um, you see the right ventricle, the interventricular septum, the uh, uh, mitral valve and the left ventricle. And typically, so normally the mitral valve is open during diastole. And so you want to find the point where those, the mitral valve is open and hitting the septum. And you want to correlate that with what's going on with the right ventricular free wall. So here you see that it's open. And at this moment, the right ventricular free wall is uh, sort of collapsing in, which is suggestive tamponade, uh, cardiac tamponade. Another uh, important ultrasound finding um, is the plethoric or enlarged IVC. This is both a, a great qualitative and quantitative assessment. Um, qualitative in the sense that you can just visualize the IVC, you can probe, put a probe on the patient and you see that it's enlarged. Um, and then you can use it as a quantitative assessment in that you can measure the, um, the diameter of the IVC. A good place to do that is about uh, two to three centimeters away from the atrial cable junction, which is typically where it's hepatic veins are draining. When you measure that, if it's greater than two centimeters or 20 millimeters, it's suggestive of cardiac, it's suggestive of cardiac tamponade. Um, also, too, if you see less than a 50% reduction on inspiration, um, that's also suggestive of cardiac tamponade. And um, let's see here. And another um, item that you can use when you're diagnosing cardiac tamponade is your EKG. Um, one possible finding that we look for, as mentioned earlier, is the electrical alternans, um, which is this you know, beat to beat variation in your QRS amplitude as the heart is sort of swinging towards and away, the, towards and away from the EKG. Other findings you might find on EKG would be a sinus tachycardia, um, ST elevations, and some of your uh, PR depressions that you might see also pericarditis. And another item that can be helpful is a chest x-ray. 
What you might see in chest x-ray would be like an enlarged cardiac silhouette as you, silhouette, as you see here um, with clear lung field. This isn't always seen, especially in like the acute setting, um, but some of your more um, chronic effusions that we're going to see on you might be able to see this on chest x-ray. So how are we treating tamponade? Um, it really comes to two things. It's about restoring the normal pericardial pressures as well as maximizing your intracardiac pressure. So you're you know, optimizing that intracardiac pressure by IV fluids, so giving like a nice bolus of saline. And then you're restoring the pericardial pressures as mentioned before by either doing your pericardial synthesis or your surgical drainage. So when are we doing what? Um, it was sort of mentioned before, but Really what it comes down to is a pericardiosynthesis is primarily done when the, the patient is the hemodynamic compromised, the patient's on the verge of cardiac arrest or they've arrested. Otherwise, everything else should be going to the OR. Um, indications as far as if you want a list of indications as far as when a patient's getting a pericardial window, if you did a pericardiosynthesis and there's an accumulation of uh, an infusion again, um, if you suspect like a purulent pericarditis, if there's need for a biopsy. Um, but again, really a pericardiosynthesis in the emergency room is your hemodynamically patient. And we've talked about um, how to do like a pericardiosynthesis before in great length, but this is just a video of what it would look like. And the idea, so you have your needle sort of penetrating the fibrous part of the pericardium. And the point is really to go with the um, point of maximal effusion, and you're just sort of restoring those pericardial pressures by doing that. Okay, so takeaways. So cardiac tamponade is a life-threatening emergency. Your workup should really consist of your clinical um, exam findings plus imaging, and the gold standard for imaging is ultrasound. And what you're looking for in ultrasound is your um, systolic right atrial collapse, diastolic right ventricular collapse, and enlarged IVC. And how we're treating it, the idea behind treating it is definitely restoring those peric that pericardial pressure and um, optimizing the intracardiac pressure. And pericardiosynthesis for that hemodynamically unstable patient. Any questions? Can I just go back to the chest x-ray you put up? Yeah. <laughs> so remember, it's not just cardiomegaly, but it's that right side of the heart that's round. Usually the right side is pretty straight down. When you see that rounded right side, those are people that definitely need to get an echo to make sure they don't have it. Well, globular or bottle shape, or water bottle shape, is it? If you ever see that in service, that's the answer. <laughs> it's really important to remember that this is a clinical diagnosis. No matter what your ultrasound shows, it's a clinical diagnosis. Don't yeah, panic. Thinking, what? Tamponade, not just effusion. Yes. Um, don't be sticking needles in people's chests because you see something on ultrasound. Ever. Um, <laughs> if the patient is meditating and is hemodynamically stable, then, you know, whatever you ultrasound finds, you know, whatever you want to call an impending tamponade or echocardiographic finding consistent with tamponade, it's really a clinical diagnosis. And you should make the diagnosis because those patients would benefit probably from a window and work up and you don't want to miss it because, you know, you don't want to send the patient home and then it's going to come back and actually come with tamponade. Uh, yeah. And it's really important to remember it really does not matter the size of the infusion. I know Gary mentioned it. I'm just throwing it out there again. I'm like, just because you see 200 cc's there, don't be like, oh my God, this person is in tamponade. You know, it might be a real patient that's developed the uremic effusion over the course of two years. They can put a lot of fluid into their heart for a full period of time. Leader. Yeah, I'll ask you. 